Hi everyone, welcome back to this channel and in today's presentation we are going to discuss about flower, fruit and seeds. This video is part of a series called The Anatomy of the Plant and this is the third edition to the series. This slide shows you the topics that are going to be discussed in this presentation today. The content are going to be discussed briefly to provide a general idea about the subject. We are going to begin with a brief overview of flowers. Flowers have a varied range of colors and sizes. There can even be combinations of various colors existing in a single flower. They may also have virtually any texture, from filmy and transparent to thick and leathery, spongy to sticky, hairy, prickly, or even dewy wet to the touch. Flowers of many trees, shrubs, and garden weeds are quite inconspicuous and lack odor. Some flowers on the other hand, have a distinct fragrance that may be also used as a repellent or as perfumes. Flowers can be found anywhere ranging from freshwater or saltwater habitats to the crevices of the rocks to both deserts and forest. The elements which is responsible for their survival are sunlight, moisture, and a minimal supply of mineral. The next topic will be discussing the differences between dicots and monocots. Flowering plants can be grouped together in two main groups which are more commonly referred to as dicots and monocots. Dicots include many annual plants and virtually all flowering trees and shrubs. In annuals, the cycle is completed in a single season and ends with the death of the parent plant. Monocots, which are primarily herbaceous, are believed to have evolved from primitive dicots. The table here outlines the major differences that are present in both these groups. Dicots have a seed which has two cotyledons whereas monocots have seeds with one cotyledon. The flowers of a dicot will have four to five parts or its multiple, but the monocots have three parts or multiple of three. The leaves for a dicot plant will have a distinct network of primary veins however, monocots have parallel primary veins. In dicots we can usually see the vascular cambium and occasionally the cork cambium. The monocots do not have them, it's absent. The vascular bundles of the dicots are arranged in a particular fashion of a ring and in monocots it's scattered. Regarding the pollen, Dicots will have pollen grains with three apertures and the monocots have mostly one aperture. This part of the presentation is going to focus on the basic structure of the flower. This picture here outlines the basic features that are shared among all forms of flowers. A typical flower develops several different parts, each with its own function. Regarding the development of the flower they begin as an embryonic primordium that develops into a bud. This takes place at the specialized branch at the tip of a stalk which is called a peduncle. Then the peduncle will swell up at its tip into a small pad which is called a receptacle. The other parts of the flower, some of which are in whorls, are attached to the receptacle. The outermost whorl typically consists of three to five small, usually green, and they are leaf-like called sepals. The next whorl of flower parts consists of three to many petals. Some petals develop to form distinct separate units whereas some of them will fuse together in a singular unit. The stamens are attached to the receptacle, which is the base of the flower and often around the greenish pistil in the center of the flower. Each stamen consists of a slender filament with a sac called an anther at the top. This is where we can find the pollen grains. At the top is the stigma we can find a stalk-like style, to the swollen base called the ovary. A cavity containing one or more egg-shaped ovules lies within the ovary, after fertilization it will usually develop into a seed. Next we are going to look at the fruits and primarily focusing on its development and growth. The definition of a fruit, botanically speaking, is any ovary and its accessory parts that has developed and matured. It also usually contains seeds. A fruit will have seeds whereas vegetables will not contain seeds. All fruits develop from flower ovaries and accordingly are found exclusively in the flowering plants. Pollen grains contain specific stimulants called hormones that may initiate fruit development, and sometimes a little dead pollen is all that is needed to stimulate an ovary into becoming a fruit. It is the hormones produced by the developing seeds, however, that promote the greatest fruit growth. These hormones, in turn, stimulate the production of more fruit growth hormones by the ovary wall. This part of the presentation will discuss about seeds and the various modes through which it can be dispersed. Wind, seeds themselves may be so tiny and light that they can be blown great distances by the wind. Animals, birds, mammals, and ants all act as disseminating agents. Birds may carry seeds great distances in mud that adheres to their feet. Other birds and mammals eat fruits whose seeds pass unharmed through their digestive tracts. 
Many fruits and seeds catch in or adhere to the fur or feathers of animals and birds. Water, with a heavy downpour this could create a torrent of water which could dislodge masses of vegetation along a stream, carrying whole plants and their fruits to new locations. Large raindrops themselves may splash seeds out of their opened capsules. Other mechanisms and agents, humans can also be agents who may transport fruits and seeds. Travelers and explorers have carried many weeds and plant diseases, as well as valuable food and medicinal plants, from one continent to another. Lastly, we are briefly going to discuss on how a seed grows to develop into a plant. Structure, the dicot plants will have a seed that resemble a kidney bean. On the concave side there will be a small white scar which is called hilum. The hilum marks the point at which the ovule was attached to the ovary wall. A tiny pore called the micropylae is located right next to the hilum. When a seed is placed in water it will swell up and this will cause the seed coat to split. Once the seed coat is removed, the two halves, called cotyledons will appear. Monocots will have only one cotyledon. The embryo shoot is referred to as plumule. The cotyledons are attached just below the plumule. The part of the seed that will develop into a root is called radical. Germination, at this stage, the seed will begin its development and growth. In order to germinate, a seed must first be viable which means that it must be capable of germinating. Many seeds may require going through a period of dormancy which is brought about by either mechanical or physiological circumstances or both. Dormancy in such seeds may sometimes be broken artificially by scarification, which involves nicking or slightly cracking the seed coats. But in nature this dormancy stage will extend until the seed is exposed to any mechanical abrasion through rock particles in the soil. In order for this process to begin, germination stimulators need to be present to initiate growth. These normally do not develop unless the seeds encounter a wet period accompanied by cold temperatures. When water is present the enzymes will begin to function. A new plant begins to develop as mitosis and cell elongation take place. Most seeds require temperatures within certain ranges to germinate. The role of light in germination varies with the kinds of plants concerned. Thank you for watching this video there will be one more video coming the following week based on this series of plant anatomy. Please subscribe for more videos.